when students don't enjoy math class, a lot of times they struggle in science class. Uh, but a lot of times the problems begin here. Uh, now this is how I taught for my first eight years of teaching, and I'm just trying to break free from this pattern. So I would typically take up homework, right? And that's how I was taught as well. Students would come in, we would go through the homework for the day, and then after that, I would give them the stuff they needed for the next piece of the puzzle, right? I'm gonna give you the definitions. Today, we're gonna to be talking about ratios and rates. A rate is, and then we would write it down. A ratio is, and we'd write all of these things out to make sure that they had that resource. I'd then give them a bunch of examples. Now, I don't know if you're like me, but when I was planning my note, I would look to my textbook, and your textbook may be similar, maybe it's not, but I would break down, I would look and there would be like section A of the textbook would have like all the same type of problem and just different numbers. Section B, section C, and so forth. If there was five sections, I would do five examples, one of each of those sections, right? So that my students wouldn't have any trouble with the homework that I was gonna give them. So it seems fairly logical, right? Seems fairly logical. And our textbooks are set up in a very similar way. Uh, this is where I took the correlation coefficient picture from. Uh, this is the finite textbook I used in high school. And you'll check it out inside of there. It's very engaging because they're using color. <laughs> Did you see that? They're using red. You can barely see it. It's kind of washed out. This is my uh, high school textbook I still had. And uh, you'll notice that it's, it runs in much of the same way that I, t I taught my math lessons. I would give all the definitions a little bit of, you know, over here it talks about uh, doing the same type of job, so trying to make a connection to where you'll use this information. And then down here we're going to give you some important stuff you got to know. And then we're going to start doing some examples. Except, if you're like my students, or if your students are like mine, that example is not so engaging, right? Would you all agree? It's not like captivating you. Is anyone dying to solve this problem? <laughs> Maybe you're, you'd rather be dying is what some of the kids are thinking, right? Uh, so looking at here, we've got combinations. We're trying to introduce the concept. And I think we can all see what's actually happening here. The textbook wants to make it simplistic so that we don't lose anyone, right? Like we want to make sure it's very, very simple to start. I've got four colors, and I want to know how many different combinations. If you read up here in this little red box, you'd know that a combination order doesn't matter. We just want the different groupings of it, right? And then part B, we see it doesn't get much better there than, than that previous uh, example. So it kind of makes sense that when I had my students sleeping in class, that they were sleeping, right? I was barely staying awake and I was the guy standing up at the front. I had a really, really tough time here. And I used to go home thinking like, what can I actually do? And then what I realized one day is what was happening in my classroom had been happening when I went to school. I was getting two groups of students, okay? And this may be familiar, it may not be, but for me, this is what I noticed happening in my classroom. I had a group of students that was good at math. Good at math. Now, how big that group is would vary, right? Your mileage varies on depending on the group you're working with, okay? And then I'd have another group of students that was not good at math. Makes sense. Now. Those students who are good at math, what I found happening in my classroom is that typically students who are good at math could understand what their definitions are, their terms, right? They understood what a radius was, like what's the radius? They knew that. And then they also knew their steps, their procedures, their algorithms, right? Math is a lot of, a lot of times comes down to algorithms. Whereas students in the not good at math group, they actually, they didn't really have either of those things. Like they had nothing. Like they were there and it was kind of almost like blank slate. They might know a piece here or there. They didn't really have the confidence uh, to maybe speak up and, and say what they thought they knew. Uh, so I knew this was a problem for me. Now, typically those students who are good at math, what I realized over time, them knowing their terminology, their definitions, their steps, their procedures, what I was really doing is I actually was seeing students that were actually good at memorizing and not necessarily good at the math. And I don't know if that is something that maybe you might see some of that familiarity, right? You had some students that, like, they knew how to do the stuff, but did they really understand the stuff, right? Did they really understand the content I was giving them? And the students in the not good at math group typically were students who had a hard time memorizing some of these things. So 
that was a problem. I was thinking, well, then either some people will be good at math and some people won't, or maybe I need to start rethinking how I do things. So that's the approach I tried to take. So I, I've been given that uh, a bit of a, a kick at the can. And this was the part that actually concerned me most, is that the students who were in the not good at math and a good chunk of my students who were good at math had something in common. Does anyone want to take a stab at what that might be? What is something that they have in common between those two groups? Anyone confidence. Wants? Confidence. Some of them over here didn't really have confidence. I would definitely agree with that. They could do it, but they weren't sure, you know, whether they were doing it correctly. I like that. Any others? <coughs> not understanding the process. Not understanding the process. Maybe not understanding, like, why, right? Like, why am I doing this? Like, I've memorized it, but I don't really know what's going on here. And what happens, building on that concept, what happens if you don't understand what you're really doing? What will happen? You put a minor chink into the question and they have no clue. Right there. Unfamiliar problems and you're gone. There's nothing. And the part for me that really concerned me, I was having a discussion with, a, with a, another math educator and basically we came down to the, the, to the fact that when students go out to get jobs, they're not, very rarely are we gonna have jobs, especially in the future, where they go in and they go, listen, I know how to calculate the area of a circle. I'm gonna do that all day for you. Just give me, four, give me the same problem over and over, different numbers, and I'm gonna crank them out for you, right? They're gonna go into this job, and they're gonna say, okay, where's the textbook? And the boss is gonna be like, this is a problem that no one knows how to solve yet. That's what I hired you for. I need you to solve the problem. And they're gonna say, but uh, where's the example? Like where, you know, where's this note that I've been provided all of my life? And they're not going to know how to problem solve. That's, that's a huge concern.